This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by Sound Porter Mastering, Adam Audio, OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, Spectra 1964, and Isotope. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z BB-29 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX-100 Mic Pre, C610 Comp Limiter, and Isotope RX and Ozone. So get ready to rock. The worst thing you can do is turn it down when something is is tuny and you and you can't fix it or you know whatever. Tuck it down and like, oh, well, it's not going to be. It's all right. We'll just turn it down in the mix. So that never works. Everything should be intentional and to the forefront. And if there's a mistake, make it make it louder. And and now it's not a mistake because obviously they wouldn't ride it and make it louder if it was a mistake, right? Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. I'm Brian Murphy, and I strive to produce masters that move your song emotionally, but maintain the spirit of your mix and the intention of the artist. My promise is to give your music its best sonic performance, not simply change it. You work hard on your mix, and I always want to respect that. My goal is to help you realize how great your mix can be, and I'll work hard to make sure it succeeds. I don't just master, I help your mix sound the best it can. Contact me for a free mastering demo at soundporter.com. I've got two words for you that will help you make your best record ever and not lose it. Storage and backup. You want fast drives for composing and recording and reliable drives for backup so you don't lose all your hard work when something goes wrong. That's why I chose OWC Mercury Extreme Pro 6G internal SSDs for my studio computer and Mercury Elite Pro external drives for archiving. Discover the best OWC drive options for your studio at maxsales.com Slash rock stars. Howdy, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome to Recording Studio Rock Stars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Justin Francis, a multiple Grammy Award nominee as an engineer, number one Billboard chart mixer, and budding producer based right here in East Nashville. His work can be heard on records ranging from Ronnie Millsap to Alice Cooper, including Top 40 Hits for Little Big Town and Kelsey Ballerini, soundtracks with Casey Musgraves in Pink, and releases from diverse artists as Rodney Crowell, Tyler Childers, Margot Price, Buddy Guy, Deep Purple, Anti-Flag, Roswell Kid, and Diarrhea Planet, reaching millions of streams every month. Justin has been a guest on the podcast previously, on episode 220, when we got to talk about his background in recording. So we'll throw a link in the show notes so you can go listen to that as well if you want. And in this episode, we'll just continue to dig more into mixing out of his studio and talk about ways that we can ramp up the quality of our own work in our own pro and home studios, and also see what things we can learn about how Justin's been staying busy during 2020, a challenging time. So please welcome Justin Francis to Recording Studio Rockstars. Are you ready to rock again? I am still ready to rock, man. <laughs> right on, dude. Glad to have you back on the show. Um, Thanks for I having know, me. I know it's a nutty year for us all, and this will come out in uh, uh, later on in the next year. But um, it's great to be hanging with you. And as I remember from our last discussion, you are nearby in East Nashville. You're not very far away. I'm not actually. I'm uh, I'm actually out in Ashland City, um, which is a, which is a bit of a haul away. That's right. And you had the log cabin that you're mixing out of as well. That's right. Yep. Still out here. Still still in the woods. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure last time I said you're right here in East Nashville, and you said no, I'm but, in Ashland City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So no sweat. Sorry, no man. Sweat. It takes me a couple of tries every time. But um, tell us about your studio again. Just give us a quick recap of you know. What you're sitting, what are you surrounded by, um, and you know this environment that you're working in right now? Uh, I am in the back couple stalls of my garage um, that was kind of that you know about a year, year and a half ago we had kind of framed out and kind of cut the back two stalls of the garage out, framed it out, and 
insulated, kind of stuffed, uh, stuffed it with the uh, insulation and that, and then uh, put fabric on the walls. Um, so the three walls around me are fabric, and then the ceiling kind of have this drop ceiling thing that's at an angle. So it's it's kind of legit. Um, nice. Li- li- little uh, little listening space. Um, you know, it's probably about. 15 feet wide by about 25 feet long. Um, and I'm just in here. I've got, I've got, uh, right now I've got all my outboard stuff here that while I'm mixing, I'm, I'm 95% in the box, but I will occasionally throw some stuff out and then just print it back in. Um, so you have a console in front of you? No, no, I've, I've got just, uh, just a couple little avid artist mix that I use for, for automation stuff and, and kind of quick balancing. But, um, but yeah, I am, I am all in the box. So the artist mix is like an, um, a fader controller, right? Right. Yeah. It's, it's basically just, just eight faders on each one. Um, that, uh, I, man, I, I like to have to just be able to, when you're, when you're, First, opening up a, a mix or um, you know a project that you haven't heard before is kind of just just seeing what your options are really quickly and just having that um, having it right in front of you where you can see you know here's here's room mics here's rooms on this here's uh, you know maybe some some GAC mics here let's just let's just see what we're working with real quick instead of you know I don't know it's a bit of more of an interesting discovery process for me than um, than clicking through and, and soloing stuff and putting it in putting everything at unity and going you know like uh, XOR solo mode whatever how what's this what's this what's this what's right. this right so you're saying that normally uh, a quick way to assess a new project you're about to mix is to just have all the faders up and then just sort of when you say XOR, you mean you click solo on the bass and it will unsolo the tambourine track that you just had soloed, for example. Correct. So- yeah, you, you know that option that that you can your solo mode. It can either be latch, where if you solo the kick in microphone and then you and then you click solo on the kick out. Now both of those are soloed. Um, yeah. Or you or you could do the the XOR. I, I think that's what it's called. Uh, where you know if, if you solo one thing, everything else gets unsoloed. So you're only soloing kind of one thing at a time. So I mean that's just a quick way for me to assess w- w- what I have there and if there's any uh, immediately noticeable uh, noise things or you know just kind of do do some preliminary investigating. So that would kind of normally how uh, I, I would do it. But with the uh, with the, these couple artist mix, I can kind of just throw some faders up and throw them down and and uh, you know see see what's going on that way. Okay, so when you have the artist mix in front of you, and the reason I'm digging in with these questions is because I've been looking at different controller surfaces, and one of the things that I think is a little frustrating for all of us when we're trying to find out what's going to work for our studio is there's kind of a perplexity of options. I don't even know if perplexity is a word, but I just made it up. Right. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, and you got some, like, ones that have been around from from Avid in the past or digit design, if I guess if you're going way back and then mm-hmm. there's newer ones and then there's like alternative controllers. Um, and so there's so many. And then the other part is I'm uh, just trying to imagine like, how am I going to use this? Why am I going to need it? So it's really cool to hear you talking about the, you know, the practical ways that having something like that really works for you as opposed sure. to the imaginary ways. Like, you know, sometimes we think, Oh, if I get this thing, I'll just be doing like, I'll just be doing magic tricks and backflips. I'll just be riding everything. Yeah, and the truth is, you may just discover that it's super useful for this one part of your process, but then you kind of blow it off for the rest of it or something. So what you're saying is, in which I feel like I've experienced as well, the speed at being able to grab a handful of faders, move things up and down, or hit that solo button or mute button can be really effective um, for, like you say, exploring where how do these how do these tracks go together? How does this music begin to mix? Mm-hmm. Um, and do you even feel like you need the pan knob right there or is, is panning sort of like a set it and forget it and it's really just levels and, and muting and soloing? Mm, well, sometimes I'll, I'll use the pan knobs for automation. Uh, I'll, if I'm automating pans and, and I kind of want it to be a, a moving thing where it kind of has a bit of a, of a, of a feel to it. Um, then I'll use the pan knobs and and uh, you know write them into into automation. 
Um, other than that, I mean, yeah, I typically wouldn't like just set static pans by by reaching out for these for these knobs. Right. So it's really, it's, but the fader is super valuable. It kind of it almost makes sense. It's literally the biggest thing about our control surface is the fader, and it's potentially the most useful thing about it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's kind of why I, I, I got into them. Um, you know, I, I was on those, um, who makes the, uh, the fader port. Was it, was it Focusrite? Oh yeah, Presonus. Or Presonus. Presonus fader port. Yeah. They've got the single one and now they have multiple faders. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, you know, so I had one of those and, um, I'm not quite sure w- why I made the switch. Maybe maybe I just came into one of these artist mix kind of on on the cheaper side. But um, I was like, well, this has seven more faders. That can't be bad, right? Yeah. Do you just have one, or do you <laughs> put a couple so you got sixteen? I have two, and um, I, again, yeah, I, I must have just come into it where um, you know there there was one to be had cheap, and I was like, oh, that could be cool, and that's kind of the pretty much the perfect size for what you know, space that I have in front of me. Um, so I was like, well, I could just nestle these two and butt them up against each other. And, um, here's a cool little, um, you know, just also just visually, you know, it's just nice to, to be able to sit and be able to reach out and grab something. Um, but you know, mostly, yeah, for, for, for the rides and stuff is, is what I, you know, 85% of the time, that's what I'm using it for is is to, to ride, to ride a single thing or, more, more, more so to ride. Uh, I do a lot of riding of effects, uh, sending you know a guitar out to a reverb or something, and kind of having a swell into a big drop or something like that. And and you can assign that to a fader uh, on one of these artist mix, and and it makes it a lot more, a lot more fun. And I, I feel like it has a lot more feeling to it when you when you physically kind of throw the fader up or down, or you know, it kind of has a more um, I don't know, my uh, minute touch to it that I like. Yeah, sometimes I feel like when you do the physical stuff, it's just so much easier to push things further because you don't worry about it as much. You know, when it's, a, when it's something on the screen and I, and I move a fader way up into a reverb send and I feel like I'm having to max it out to hear the reverb the way I want. Oh, totally. It can have this sense that I'm doing something wrong or something's broken about it. When in fact, maybe all I just need to do is just simply max it out to get the right sound, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's important to 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 ignore uh, ignore some of these boundaries, you know. Like I, and I've been trying to get over it for years, but I have got a weird OCD thing about having any track in a mix above zero, above uh, unity, whatever you want to call it. I know, me too. But but why do you think that is? Why do you have that? I don't want to go above zero. Sense. Um, I don't does that, know. Does there, that come from an, a background in, of a, that used to be a problem kind of thing? No, I think that it, I think just um, I don't know. Coming up, uh, you know, I came up on analog consoles and stuff, and that was kind of your sweet spot. Was you know zero minus five plus five, and that was where you had the most resolution on your faders. So that's generally where you wanted to be, and and kind of where you would cut stuff level wise to tape or you know to to DAW or whatever. Um, you would cut it to where you know, or at least I would, where your hi hat maybe is is you're you're cutting less level to tape, but you're still going to end up around zero instead of I hate having a hi hat track that's living at minus twenty, you know, or or, or something like that. I want everything to kind of live around uh, around zero, you know, minus five, where my faders are, uh, just because you have the most resolution there. Yeah, it's funny to me because I so rarely even end up with a hi hat track. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm you, like, you only need I, it, I'm usually you reaching need for it the, when you don't use it. Yeah, you know, exactly. When you don't have one up. Exactly. That's the, that's the rule. Um, I, I feel like I'm always reaching for the fader. Where's the anti-hi-hat tra- fader, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, but that's a good point that you bring that up. So it is one thing about recording drums I think is worth us mentioning is like, mm-hmm. you know, you can, you, you, uh, a million mics on a drum kit does not necessarily make a, a great drum sound, mm-hmm. but there are reasons to have a million mics. And sometimes those re- reasons are, you know, like a hi-hat and even a ride mic is just mm-hmm. in case you get to the mix and you're at that bridge or that verse sure. and everything else is working and you're just like, you yeah, just, if I only just, had that. Yeah. If I only had that or the, you played the hi-hat too quiet or something. 
Yep. No, that never happens. No, exactly. Not once in the history. <laughs> not once in the history of of recorded drums. All right. Cool. Um, so, so just to kind of sum that up, too, like the controller surface. If I'm hearing you right, it's really useful at the beginning when you need to um, quickly sketch in the mix, and then it's really useful toward the end when you want to be able to ride, you know, with with physical movements and you know eyes closed or whatever. You want to be able to ride those moves. Yeah, totally, man. You know, it, it, just anything to uh, anything to make you feel better, even about you know, even if it's smoke and mirrors, you know, like whatever. I know a lot of people that are like, you know, just just ride it with your mouse. Who who cares? And and you know, who cares if it's just a linear movement that's going up sixty B? You know, where it needs to build up in the last bar to to the last chorus. It's like, man, but I want I want to go gradually, and then I want I want to adjust the the ramp, you know, and I don't want to spend time. Uh, drawing that in, you know, w- with a, with a mouse and, and click, you know, and it, if it, uh, yeah. if it makes me, even if it just makes me feel better to, uh, to ride that guitar solo into, into the solo section, then by God, just let me have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's like, um, programming instruments versus just playing them. It's a lot of times it's more fun to play them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just, I don't know, little, little subtle differences. I, I, I'm a, proponent of uh of the the notion that everything matters you know the guitar pick matters mm. uh d- different cables maybe not on a a single source um instance maybe you know maybe your microphone cables you know maybe you're not going to hear a difference between this cable or that cable but if you you've got 50 of them across the session i think that you, you that it is additive and you are going to notice uh, a a perceivable difference hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I've definitely experienced cables sounding different. Um, I have some here that I consider my best sounding ones, and I try and use them whenever I mm-hmm. can. Yeah. Um, and it. then I've also got ones that I built myself that I used to think were my best sounding ones, but now <laughs> if I go listen to them, I'm like, oh, that's that's got that sound that I'm always fighting. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, isn't that funny? Yeah. Um, well, very cool. So uh, tell us again about what you like to do as far as monitoring in your control room. And then also, you very quickly said, like, got the insulation up and then put up fabric. Maybe explain a little deeper what that means, because somebody might be like, you know, somebody might still have an empty room with some blank walls and they know they need to treat it, but they kind of don't have, they're not sure what, what the first easy moves are. Sure. Yeah, totally. Well, um, you know, uh, so I had, you know, it was Three, um, I'm trying to think of what it was. It was the, the two sides of this garage were just, just cinder block. Um, you know, and it was, it was concrete floor. And then one wall that was kind of attached to my house was drywall. Um, so I basically, you know, you, you put just, you frame it out, put studs every two feet or so. And then I stuffed it with insulation and, stretch fabric over it. So, so I, I wanted to have, you know, about 75% of the, the walls and surface areas in here to be fabric and absorptive. So this um, is, this is when you say framing it out, you're talking about like kind of a fake wall inside the existing wall. Correct. Yes. Yes. You know, you just, just put a, put a, um, I, yeah, just, just framing it out so that you have, um, yeah, a, a fake wall inside of your, yeah, you're you're creating an, uh, a smaller room inside of <laughs> inside of your room, right. albeit and, and you know frame, two inches smaller. The frame that you're building is actually going right up to and touching the drywall, or going right up to and touching the correct um, the, the concrete brick. Yep, correct. So you're yeah, you know you're you're basically you're framing it out, you know, on each wall that you want to do. And okay, cool. So now you have this kind of false wall, and now you can start to kind of stuff it with your rigid fiberglass or um, whatever. The, what's the number of the stuff? Oh, 703. 703, yeah. yeah or rock um, wall is another one. Right, right. So we just, you know, stuffed it all uh, there and even, you know, paid particular attention to every little, like, crevice that's going up into the ceiling, too, making sure that everything was was stuffed up tight so that, uh, I mean, you know, I'm trying to keep as much noise inside of this room and not get into the rest of the house as possible. Right, right. Um, just trying to be courteous. Yeah, totally. All right. So, um, okay. So then when you put this insulation, it's like the insulation is going up and stopping where the wall is, but it's between the, 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 um, 
<laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? I'm an architect. I should know these things. But the uh, no, the, yeah. the um the the uh, studs of your Correct. fake frame wall, and then right. and then you put the fabric over the studs of that fake frame wall to kind of hide all that insulation. Right. So that you know you 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 get a big old roll of fabric, and you know you start at the top and you roll it down, and you're kind of holding. You know. You, <clears throat> better to have somebody else do this with you so you, you know you kind of hold it taut and then you're kind of just stapling that fabric going down these uh these studs and once you have all of that you know you've got taut fabric that's stapled to the walls then you can just cover it up those studs over top of that fabric you can put another piece of trim and you hide the staples and stuff and you you've got a nice little decorative uh you know stained piece of trim that you can you can put over it and it kind of looks cool and it kind of looks um i don't know it's got kind of a, a z, you know kind of uh zen japanese vibe to me i've got this light like beige fabric and it kind of looks like um i ha- also have some tatami mats that are mounted on the rear wall that the rear wall is is kind of angled uh, so it kind of looks like a V, you know, an outward V that's kind of coming into the room. And on either side of those, I have some framed, you know, three foot wide by seven foot tall tatami mats that I kind of have just mounted on the wall, mostly for decoration, but also to kind of displace anything that might be bouncing off that back wall. Nice, nice. All right. And then, um, uh, so I'm sitting in my ISO booth in my studio because I'm I'm doing a, a studio redo here, which yeah. hopefully by the time this podcast is out, I'll be bragging about how Indeed. amazing it sounds. Yeah, and not still working on it, but my control room is you know totally gutted right now, and uh, and in my dead room I did what you're describing, and one of the things I did notice that was interesting. I wonder if you felt this too. It might be different in my case because I just have a lot more surfaces close to me. Mm-hmm. But when I stretched stretched the fabric, the room had a dead quality to it, which I was going for. Mm-hmm. And then when I put up the trim to cover the staples, it sort of livened the room back up again a little bit. Did you do you remember noticing that at all? Oh wow, interesting. Um, I I didn't notice that. Um, and I, how how big are your pieces of trim? Probably they're too just big. Like, they're like one by three, or no, they're like a half. One by threes, maybe that's what they are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I feel like mine are maybe one by twos, um, and they're just going. You know, they're they're every two, no, every every four feet. Yeah. Uh, I framed it out so they're they're two foot center. So there's a stud every two feet, but every four feet is where I had the the fabric stapled. So that's where okay. the pieces of trim are going. So I feel like it. That's maybe a a little bit too little. It's not enough trim. I I feel like to. To yeah. make a difference to, to me, but it's uh, yeah. So that's in your control room or your live? No, no, it's in my dead room, um, which I, I've just turned into my control room. So that's where I'm joining us from. So, rock stars, if you really notice that my voice is sounding really just great right now, it could yeah. be because I'm in my ISO booth. <laughs> nice. Do you want to know how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of recording studio rock stars? Well, I've been cheating all along by using Isotope RX and Ozone on every single episode. Right now, you are hearing RX D-Click, D-Clip, D-S, D-Plosive, Voice D-Noise, Ozone Multiband Compression, EQ, and Limiting on my voice. If you want great, consistent mixes too, go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off. The secret to great sounding bass in your mix is to start with a great recording. If you've got an awesome part, player, and instrument, then all you need next is to plug that into the BBDI passive direct box from Spectra 1964 through the C610 comp limiter, and you've got an incredible bass tone that goes all the way down. The BBDI is the best sounding bass DI I have ever used. It'll move your pant leg. No height, no color, just pure tone at spectra1964.com. Um, so then, uh, okay, so here's another geeky uh, question. We'll get, uh, we'll get away from mm-hmm. construction. But if you've got your, those um, studs spaced four feet apart from each other, then I imagine it was a little bit challenging. It, did you use pink insulation in between them, or did you use the 703 stuff on the wall? Uh, I, I think it was the, yeah, it was the 703 rock wool stuff. And, and the, the studs are actually two foot. So it was, it was the, the, the size of the oh, rock wall. Oh, I see. So you didn't you didn't staple into every stud. You you just 
Correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. The the, the fabric was, you know, stretched. So it was, it was at least four feet long. Got it, so got every, it. every four feet, there's an outer piece of trim, but behind the fabric, it's two foot centers for the studs. So it was nice and tidy for the, uh, for the insulation. Okay, cool. Um, well, thanks for clarifying that. And Rockstars, mm-hmm. for those of you who are trying to think about dialing out your room, I hope this little, you know, dive into the details is helpful. Yeah, basically, I mean, just, just, I don't know, or rule of thumb is, you know, almost kind of the deader, the better. Yeah. Uh, you know, as far as a listening environment goes, uh, you know, you, you want, you want what you're, where you're sitting to, to be as, as accurate and as true to what's coming out of the speakers as possible. And you, you don't want things bouncing back and <clears throat> kind of clouding your, your, uh, what you're hearing that's coming directly from the speakers. Yeah. Now, another thing I think that people run into sometimes is they dead in the room, but they don't realize that they're not really having any effect on low, f- lower frequencies aren't really deadening. They're just still built up. Right. Um, but you said your room is 15 by 25. So therefore, that really sort of drops the lowest modes a whole lot more. Um, mm-hmm. any, any other things that you did that you felt like just sort of helped the low end for you? Uh, help the bottom end? Not, I mean, supposedly the 703 or the Rockwell stuff is <clears throat> supposed to absorb frequencies at, at a more equal r- ratio, I guess you would call it, than, than some of the like the, the pink stuff or the, the uh, whatever that is, just normal insulation. Supposedly the denser stuff is supposed to absorb lower frequencies uh, more as opposed to the, the stuff that isn't so dense, more so kind of just absorbs the highs and then mm-hmm. you're left with this this big boominess so that's why I, I wanted to make sure to to get something that was kind of as, as balanced as possible um but basically that's that's the only um you know i didn't really do any other kind of like modifications to it once i was up and running besides i put a couple baffles that are um you know my ceiling is kind of angled and it comes down at kind of a 45 and then it goes up at a 45 kind of like a v and right where the v meets you know where those two ends meet is kind of Below that is my listening spot, um, and I did that so that nothing was bouncing directly straight down at me. It was either bouncing, you know, three feet in front of my face or three feet behind my head. Um, cool. But I, I still was hearing just a little bit, so I just put put some stuff up up above me um, to kind of cut down any of those reflections. Nice. Well, um, I guess that's about as sciencey as we need to get on this stuff. And, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe a good takeaway is is just um, doing something is better than doing nothing in the space. And just by proactively trying to get it to sound good. Um, sure. I've yeah, found just be that, conscious. Yeah, like every time I try and do that, it does get better. You know, there's just, you just sort of do all the things you can think you might need to do and they usually, it usually helps. Mm-hmm. Well, cool. So, um, and then did you say what kind of monitors you you like to mix with? Uh, man, I'm still on these uh, Tannoy Super Golds uh, with the, the Mastering Labs crossover. The, those old guys, they're old concentric Cocentric, is that how you say it? Where the tweeters in the center of the woofer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't um, know. I don't know how to say it, but is it concentric or cocent concentric? Uh, so yeah, yeah I've I got those as kind of my mains, uh, and then I've got a pair of PMC uh, Result Sixes on the outside that I'll use for kind of uh, you know tuning vocals or editing or any kind of light, you know, something where I don't need a a, a big old um, you know bass response for just kind of low volume but but kind of critical uh editing editing uh ears when i put my editing ears on yeah so the the tano is the big ones that you know if you're going to do a guitar and bass overdub in the control room that's what you want to be using sure yeah and you know and they're not huge they're they're 10 inch speakers but um yeah they they are definitely my my hefty hefty ones my my main go-tos so when you say the the sixes are off to the side like you don't need to do um I don't know if you said if you described it as good for critical listening or not, but but for editing, tuning vocals, I've noticed that about tuning vocals, I will use my uh, Avon Tone speaker, mm-hmm. and I just put it put the mix in mono, and I send it over to the Avon Tone and turn it way mm-hmm. down, and I find it remarkably easy. It's the weirdest thing, but it's like so much easier for me to pick vocals for being a great performance in tune or out of tune. Oh yeah, on a little teeny speaker where there's no other distractions about it. It's almost like, you know, you could work all day on something, and then you go listen to that thing on the iPhone speaker later, and you're like, "How that sounds terrible!" Like, how did I think that right. that was a good vocal performance or whatever? 
Yeah, because you tend to kind of get inside of it too much if you're listening, A, too loud, or B, if you're listening to something that's, <clears throat> you know, that, that's so, um, I don't know, either so detailed or so um, so good sounding, you know, that, that you, you see past performances and you're, and you're, you're hearing other things. Uh, whereas if you kind of simplify it and yeah, throw it down to a, to an Oratone or, or, you know, a pair of NS10s or, or something like that, you can, you put yourself in almost a, a more of a real world listening environment and you can, now you're just listening to music and you're listening to performances. You're not listening to audio, so to speak. Yeah, no, I dig it, man. And when you say like, it's just sound sounding so good, uh, this, of course, would go both ways, but I'll use the uh, the dating analogy. Like, yeah. you know, if you're a guy and you see a girl who looks so amazing, mm. you, you might really overlook some fundamental personality, you know, mismatches, <laughs> for example. Or if you're, you know, a woman and you see a guy who looks like, you know, I don't know, whatever, a GQ model, you sure. might miss the fact that, like, they don't, they don't have some of the basic uh, relationship things you need. So, sure. and that totally makes sense. It's like, it's distracting and stereo is distracting for me too. It's like, it's like, um, some kind of magic trick, you know, the, the sonics of really great speakers. So. Sure. That's interesting. I, I never really switch into mono when I'm, when I'm tuning a vocal or anything, but typically when I'm, when I'm tuning a vocal, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of slim down the, the mix. So I'm just hearing maybe an acoustic guitar or, or something in a vocal and I'm not listening to the whole mix. Uh, and sometimes I'll even throw the acoustic guitar to one side and I'll keep the vocal center. So, so I can kind of key in uh, on the vocal a little bit more and not be so distracted with rhythmically what, what the acoustic is doing. Cause I'll throw that off to one side, but yeah, that, that's interesting. Well, so let's talk about vocal tuning. What does that mean to you? What is some of your process for tuning a vocal? Man, I, you know, it, it's like, I, I hate I, actually, I don't hate doing it. I kind of like doing it. It's kind of fun, but um, but it's but a I, it's a shift. It's a gear shift. You don't do it in the middle of stuff, right? You like sure, yeah. And, you know, I, I only try to you know you you only try to do it when it when it's absolutely necessary. When you when you don't have any other options, you know, you as, mean like as every last, time, <laughs> like every time you open a session before you even listen to it, throw it in the tuner, and you know, no, uh, you know, I, I I say that with all sincerity. I, I really try to to make it a last. Um, a last, uh, uh, you know, uh, last priority or whatever, uh, a last call to, um, to open up the tuner. But, um, why don't, why don't we, let me, let me start you with a question. So I get it. Like you don't do it unless you need to. So the flip side to that is suggesting that if you do it when you don't need to, you run the risk of something. So what, what to you happens that we should be aware of to look out for if we tune a vocal when really we should have just left it natural for example well tuning it too much you know it's it's it makes things a bit unbelievable doesn't it you know i i i'll even even when i am tuning a vocal you know i'll throw things a little sharp whenever it's that final push into that last chorus it's like because naturally that's what he or she is going to do he or she's going to really if they're really belting it out typically they're not going to fall short, they're going to be over a little bit. And that's, I, I feel like just, uh, subconsciously that, that is a, is a, is a, uh, propellant of, of excitement. If, if something goes a little yeah. bit sharp in the vocal it, it, during that final push, you know, there's things like that, that, you know, if you just tune everything kind of flat and you're right there exactly dead on the entire time, it's like, well, I don't know, that's a little, it's a little boring. Anybody can do that. Right. I've noticed that, um, a tuned vocal can take excitement out of a performance because it it's almost like it makes it sound like it was easy to hit the note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or totally. Yeah. Can I can I share a an amazing auto tune trick? If there's any auto tune, if anybody's ever heard of auto tune, absolutely. Uh, there's there's <laughs> there's an amazing trick that I just learned this year that blew my mind wide open. So normally, if I if I go to tune a vocal, you would you would open up auto tune, you'd go to graph mode, whatever you would hit track and you would kind of track it all in and you would do that in real time. Right. Right. Uh, you know, just hit track, kind of arm it and then play the track top to bottom. So somebody turned me on to, you can, you, you do the same thing, put auto tune on the track, put it in uh, graphic mode, arm it as if you were going to play it down top to bottom. And then 
in uh, in whatever the the newest version of Pro Tools are, you you can do your commit. So you right click on the Auto Tune plug and you say you know commit up to this insert. And you basically you say yes, go ahead, commit, make it to a new track. It does an offline commit of that plug. And then it makes a duplicate track of it. Uh, and then you just erase the the new duplicate track and you're all graphed into Autotune already. Does oh, that you make mean sense? Because, you follow? Yeah. So in other words, it it without it showing you, it actually loads the whole track into Autotune. Offline. Then it, then it commits it and you just get rid of the printed audio. But if you go back to that Autotune plugin, there On is, your original there it track. is loaded in already. Correct. Okay. And cool. you can and you can do that with say you have seven or ten or however many vocals you arm them all up. If I'm doing a thing where I need it to be super tight, and I'm gonna go through and hand tune all of these, I'll load the tuner onto all of these tracks, arm them all up, and then do a kind of a batch commit, and it'll offline them in you know a five minute song. It'll take you know. A, 15 seconds maybe wow. to, to load them all in it'll make seven duplicate tracks uh which are you know the quote-unquote committed audio which you don't need because there's nothing actually being done to it yet so you, you ditch all those and you go back to your original tracks and you're all graphed in and and ready to rock that's awesome dude i, I think i i may have heard somebody suggest that too so i'm, I'm glad you brought that up again Hmm. Um, because like I said, at the beginning of this, I need to hear it at least twice to remember it. No. Yeah. It's just a huge time saver. For um, me. I think that might work for Melodyne as well then potentially. And, I would imagine um, it would anything that any, anything that you can commit, you know, you, you kind of, and don't want to do it in real time. You just do an offline commit and in theory, it's going to run, run that stuff through the plug and do, do as, is exactly how it would, uh, in real time. Yeah, so AutoTune is your go-to. Um, do you find that you like using a variety of different tuning options, you know, plugins or or software? Or do you pretty much stick to AutoTune no, and get, get I, what you need I, that way? Yeah, stick stick to the AutoTune. It's just because um, that's kind of just how I how I came up. You know, it's just the the one that I latched onto. Um, I hear wonderful things about Melodyne and the polyphonic uh, options there, and kind of the the tonal shaping options and trying to shift words into other words and stuff. But it's like, man, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I do want the ability to be able to do it, but I, uh, I, I try to avoid stuff yeah, like that. If it sounds good, it sounds good. Yeah. Um, so w describe to us um, as much as you feel like you can here, mm -hmm. you know, in podcast format, but, but, you know, how so you load all you you got four vocals you load them into autotune now the autotune's mm -hmm. ready what's next you pull up the autotune window do, will autotune show you all four of those tracks within the one window or do you sort of do one at a time or do you have a couple of different tuner windows up and and then you're looking at multiple vocals at once how does that work for you no nah, i would just do it one at a time you know if you say you have a a lead vocal and then you have a double and a triple that maybe are going to be panned hard left and right and you you really want them to be laser tight um i'll just go through and just do them one at a time you know and so you're um, is it are you really trusting your ear as far as whether these things are lining up and in tune together and stuff uh do you are there visual cues that you know, the doubles going to a half step wrong note or any of those kind of things? Well, you know, I, I guess b before any of the tuning stuff goes in, I'll, I'll kind of just listen to them top to bottom, you know, maybe even soloed and make sure that everything is in check and do any of my kind of nudging around or editing before I would do any tuning, making sure S's and T's line up and there's no obnoxious breaths and um, stuff like that that's coming from the left side but not the right side. So how would you make, how would you do that? Would you do you have a way to manipulate those if they don't quite line up? Um, man, you know there's there's that uh, what's that plugin suite? Is it re re voice or re re box right, or right. something that kind of automatically lines it up? And uh, I, I tried that before, but I, I just I kind of maybe the OCD in me I just didn't trust it all the way, so I I always just do them by hand and. Normally, you know, I'll just start it at the top of the t track and just play it down. And as it's playing down, I'm, I'm a listening to what's going on 
to uh, during playback, but I might also be scrolling ahead further down the track and visually lining up anything that I can see is an obvious uh, an obvious edit that needs to happen or where it needs tightened up. And then if something catches my ear, maybe I'll drop a marker um, and to know to go back to that. But I'm also scrolling ahead and, and kind of doing it visually that way, yeah. which is maybe just a crazy way to, to work. But No, that's just because you know what you're doing and you can you know, yeah. get ahead of the game. But so as far as, um, you know, manipulating something that doesn't quite line up with another vocal, mm-hmm. uh, I suppose if the entire phrase is off, you can just kind of, you know, grab, grab it and just sort of scoot it back or scoot it forward. But do you find that, that there's a lot of room for us to actually change the shape and the timing of a, a vocal double phrase or a harmony, you know, just by chopping it, removing bits, cross-fading it back together and that sort of thing? Sure, yeah. I mean, you can, you know, I, I think people would be surprised at how much you can, you can, uh, you can change something um, just by doing little edits and putting this, even this sound here from another phrase into here. I need, I need a uh sound right here that is a little bit more closer, you know, that is a little bit closer to what the lead vocal is doing or whatever, and just, just kind of cutting and pasting. But I guess I'm still kind of using the, um, you know, super basic methods of doing that, whereas just using your ear and like, here's, here's what I need from somewhere else. I need a hard T. I, I'd go in, grab that and paste it here and nudge it around until it, until it sounds right or nudge it around until it looks right and then listen to it and make sure it make sure it jives. Yeah, that's cool. I think that's just that reminder that like, you know, our biggest skill set is still just, you know, what we can do with basics like editing and um it's even like you said about mixing, you know, first rule of mixing is just uh set the levels, you know. Yeah, you know, and and, and it's you try not to get too inside of things like that, you know, and, uh, because I don't know. It, it, at the end of the day, it's like, is anybody really going to, is somebody going to change the channel because, uh, because your, your double on the left, you know, like the T ended a little bit after the T on the right or, you know, it's like, give me a break. I, I, I just got done doing this record where there was a, I had a, a guest background vocalist come in. It was kind of a featured vocal and they sang the word the in the chorus and the, and, and because the lead vocalist was doing that, but then the lead vocalist came back and was like, oh, these, it, it's actually the word for. So, it, and, it, and it's an important change. So they changed it and we were on a tight deadline. I couldn't get this background singer back. And I was like, well, let's just change the lead and see what happens. And it's amazing how much it now sounds like those background vocals are saying the correct word now that you just changed the lead vocal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had it, it, all of a sudden it's morphed. I had Ian Shepard on the show. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was Ian who shared this, uh, or it may have been Mike Senior, but it, it's a a video that demonstrates how the visual will make us think we're hearing something different. So they use this exact same sound and they change it from a ba, ba to a wow. tha or something like that. Sure. Um, and it was just all it was was the, uh, or no, from a fa to a ba. And it was just the 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 video, the audio was the same, but the video changed. So we saw wow. the lips moving differently. Yep. And it's like you're saying, you know, as long as you hear the lead and you know what it's doing, then you're going to think that the backgrounds are doing that too. And yeah. So many times I've missed a background, then you go solo and you're like, what? They're not singing the right word, you know? Yep. Yeah. No, totally. Or Or there's like that, the old trick of like, <clears throat> supposedly, you know, Beatles, if there was any pitchiness, like, of course, I supposedly that's why they started doubling and stacking their vocals up to to mask any kind of or you know anything of the era not not just necessarily mm-hmm. them but uh was to stack it up and kind of have the natural kind of chorusing of it will mask any tuniness but um there was also the trick where if there was a lead vocal that was a little bit out of tune in that section you just ride it up so it's just louder than hell so that everybody's right. pit, frame of pitch reference goes to the vocal and now the now the vocal's correct, and that's all they're focused on for that second. And somehow their pitch center gets manipulated. The worst thing you can do is turn it down when when something is is tuny and you and you can't fix it or you know whatever. If you tuck it down and like, oh well, it's not going to be. It's all right. We'll just turn it down in the mix. So that never works. Everything should be intentional and to the forefront. And if there's a mistake, make it make it louder. 
and, right. and now it's not a mistake because obviously they wouldn't ride it and make it louder if it was a mistake, right? No, but that's such a great tip, that reminder that our pitch reference is based on whatever sort of sets the baseline for pitch. And if you turn the vocal right. up and that becomes a loud thing, then that's our your ear goes center. to that. And then maybe the rest of the band is like kind of, you know. Right, but you would never, but you would never, um, you would never materialize that in your in your head. You'd never be like, "Oh, well, the entire band is out of tune for that one lot, for that one word." Right. Instead right. of like, you, maybe you would if you turn that vocal down, you'd be like, "Ooh, they're a little pitchy there." You would if you turned it up, you wouldn't think the whole band is out of tune for that word. <laughs> Sometimes you just need a mic that will stand out in a mix. That's when you need the new BB29 Signature Series from Jay-Z Microphones. The unique single diaphragm golden drop capsule gives the BB29 airy highs and smooth mid-range to help your track stand at the front of your mix. Jay-Z's handcrafted, fully discreet microphones come with a five-year warranty and free shipping to the U.S. You're hearing my voice on the BB29 right now. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jzmike.com. All right, so tell us a little bit about some of the ways that you've managed to stay busy this year in 2020 with your studio. You know, I think you mentioned some sort of guerrilla style track building and stuff like that. What have you been up to? Yeah, man, you know, like I've, I'm so fortunate to have had a place to work. Um, you know, because before I built this place, I was I was mixing in studios um, it, in town. You know, uh, kind of more on the road, and that would not be that would not have been an option for several months. Um, you know, for me, so so I was thankfully I had a place to work when all this started, and um, you know, it, to be able to uh, collaborate with people on the internet is a wonderful thing, and it was a new thing for me. Um, you know, I, I'm used to working with a band or a bunch of musicians in the room at the same time and everybody feeding off each other in real time. And just the, uh, the, the ability to, to kind of bounce things back and forth and kind of just how that feels a little bit different is, uh, was, was definitely a learning, a learning process for me. But, um, yeah, yeah I, you know, it's kind of building, building some tracks with a couple people that were, they were out of state. Um, you know, they would just make a pro tool session and do a, do a scratch acoustic vocal maybe and upload it to a Dropbox and be like, Hey, check, check this out. So you guys I, never, you, you didn't opt to use like the project feature of pro tools, for example. No, I, you know, to be honest, I, I, I'm never got hip to that. Yeah. The cloud collaboration. I'm surprised. Uh, I don't see that getting used as much, but it's always there. It's like the ability to just open the same session together and, and you know, audio files and stuff obviously update to each system independently. And, yeah, and I think like, in fact, like if you and I had the same session open and you recorded something, I think I just hit a uh, update on my track and a moment later that thing is now in my session in the same spot. Well, I guess, um, I, I don't, yeah, I guess, I mean, effectively this is sort of the same thing, but maybe it's just like a, a, a more old school way to do it where it's just like, here, you've got the tapes. I'm going to mail the tapes back to you, and you're going to, you know, right, exactly. it's a, update it's, it, and then you're going to mail it back to me. And you know, we're still using the the internet, of course, but it's like just throw the session in a Dropbox and just make sure we're not opening it at the same time. You know, yeah, and maybe right, I'll right. I'll throw down a scratch, you know, drum bass, you know, rhythm section um, to it, and then send it back to them, and they can immediately be like, eh, let's try a different fill option here. Let's try this. Let's try that. And just kind of bouncing stuff back and forth until, you know, you, you have something um, built, you know, and the ability to, to outsource, you know, stuff that, that we can't do on our own, um, it, you know, instrument wise or, or vocally, um, be, you know, this town is amazing and you can send a track over and, you, you know, Mickey Raphael sent you a harmonica track back in an hour. You know, it's, That's it's wild. unbelievable. So what are some, um, and, and so just to kind of close that other thought too, while there are these sort of high level collaboration features and cloud things, I think that the truth is one of the reasons why we do things like share a Dropbox with somebody and just, ha you know, close the session, open the session mm -hmm. is the most important thing of collaborating over the internet is you got to have a common language, right? And, and sure. most people understand Dropbox 
So therefore, mm-hmm. most people would understand that idea of like, oh, you put the session in Dropbox, I'll just open it from there. Great. And now I'm, now I'm recording. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, because you're, I don't know, it, it, at least in these instances, I'm typically dealing with songwriters, not engineers, not, you know, uh, pe- not maybe super studio savvy people. Um, so, you know, that's a, they they know how to use Dropbox, like you said, and just open it up from there. And that's kind of the easiest way to, to go about it or, you know, was, was for us. Yeah. And I mean, just, just the idea that like, there are a lot of different tools out there that will do different things. I mean, I did, I played bass as an overdub on a session in Montreal by oh. through Cubase. And it was like this app on mine that I played mm. into, it had mixers on it and everything. But with each of these different things, it requires both people on either end to know it and understand it and to be mm-hmm. able to use it. And so, you know, go simple rock stars. Don't, don't feel like somehow you're not engineer enough if you're doing this in a really simple way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or, you know, like, uh, what, a, just don't, don't interrupt the flow or don't interrupt the, the vibe of what you have going and, and chase down a, an issue that's going to take you, you know, an hour, even though maybe that would be a superior option. It's like, well, maybe you're not going to be inspired to do it anymore. If, uh, if you you take that hour and okay now we're technically doing this correct and we're all uh, lined up and on the same page our tape machines aligned hundred pro- percent properly and you know now nobody wants to play anymore <laughs> yeah there was you know? what's that expression it was like nobody ever walked out of a music store whistling the sound of the console yeah right, right. You know, yeah. nobody ever listened to that num- number one record and said like man, it sounds like, like they really use that, the latest, greatest cloud collab feature, you know, to get yep. this done. Um, yeah. Or plug-in. All right, cool. Sure. So so um, you're collaborating with people. Let's talk about some of the stuff that people will run into. So I know uh, you've, got, you've got this session that's in Dropbox. You opened it. You just said you got to make sure you close it and then they open it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also, sometimes you don't want somebody to mess up your... You want to have your safety session that they don't mess up. Now you got multiple sessions out there. Now you have to get stuff from over here to over here and put sessions back together. Talk about some of the stumbling blocks you ran into for um, making sure it was easy to um, manage all these files and things. Um, and there, there wasn't too too many roadblocks that that we hit. Uh, you know, again, yeah, we were just super careful to not open it at the same time. Um, but um, yeah, I feel like we were. You know, I, I I always had a a safety of it on a you know on a hard drive that was here locally that wasn't up in a cloud. So there was, you know, at the end of the day, if there's any weirdness i always had it on a drive and it was always updated after every after every session um and so yeah i i just made sure that i kept on top of it that way and you know if there's any small issues like they open it and all of a sudden this vocal isn't here it's like well it's bound to be somewhere you know (laughs) so just let's just let's find it and uh you know i don't know there's no emergencies in music that's that's uh that can be our our quote Right. Well, I I did run into one thing which probably won't relate to the music stuff, but it does mm. for the podcasting where I used to record, I used to make a new Pro Tools session and right inside a folder that was right inside my Dropbox folder. And then I would record the interview until it was done and hit stop. And then, you know, it would, as I close the session, it would just all upload and now it's synced sure. to the cloud. But um, things changed with that and um, Dropbox started manipulating the folder before the recording was done and it Ooh. and it caused it to strip like the header off of the wave file and i'm getting really geeky here but what what it meant was when i'd hit it maybe it would drop out a record in the middle and then it would lose the audio because oh, it wow. had sort of like deconstructed the audio file so stuff to watch out for maybe oh yikes you maybe don't record straight into a Dropbox folder with like really crit- mission critical stuff maybe copy it over afterwards from somewhere else Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I honestly, I can't remember how we were doing it. Um, if, if maybe I was recording locally and then just up updating the Dropbox after every kind of, you know, session that I had with it or any time that I'd spent with it, maybe I was just updating that Dropbox and not writing directly, 
you know, yeah, trying so. to trying to write directly to it. Well, I think in my case it was because I was, re- you know, recording long interviews like this one. <laughs> sure. Yeah, totally. A gold bar should be kept safe in a vault because it's valuable, but it could be replaced if it was ever lost. One of your songs or recordings, on the other hand, is worth more than gold because it's one of a kind. It's you. And if it was ever lost, it could never be replaced. So wouldn't you feel better knowing your music was safe? This is why I like to have a dedicated system drive, audio work drive, virtual instrument storage drive, cloud storage, and an extra large backup drive in my studio computer. And when I'm finished with the project, I move it onto a dedicated pair of external drives for archiving. Thanks to OWC, I can count on my drives being super fast, reliable, and secure so that I can work quickly and sleep soundly at night knowing my music is safe. I want your music to be safe too. Discover the best options for storage and backup for your studio from OWC at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Have you ever wished you could remove the click track bleed from a singer's vocal mic, the sound of shuffling feet from a full choir, or clicking noises from the valves of an otherwise brilliant trumpet solo? These are just some of the incredible things I've been able to clean up, edit, or remove from a recording using the magic of Isotope RX. Great for mixing with a collection of plugins for your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with the set it and forget it simplicity that lets you you focus on your creativity in the studio while you let Isotope handle the audio challenges. If you've ever wanted to truly feel like a magician in the studio, then Isotope RX is your magic wand. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars in the show notes and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off your first purchase. All right, Rockstars, we're back now for the second half of the show. My guest today is Justin Francis, joining us to talk about making cool records. You know, we just talked about some cool stuff, but we're going to go into mixing now and start talking about some of the projects that you've been doing, Justin. Are you ready to jam, man? I am ready to jam. Sweet. All right. So um, you've been doing this quarantine track building. I know you've been getting into some production this year as well. Um, Talk about some of your favorite projects uh, that you've been doing recently. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, uh, there's a track that just came out from an artist named Caroline Spence that I had the privilege of doing one of these kind of quarantine building, um, sessions with, you know, and ended up being, being producer on and kind of recorded it and played on a lot of it. And it's kind of a, uh, my big old, uh, ugly thumbprint was all over it. What, what's um, your go-to instrument? Are you guitar mainly? Man, you know, I, I grew up playing guitar and singing in, in bands and stuff, but, um, you know, and I, I try to play, you know, I, I try to play, you know, three, three to five times a week, just pick it up and do something. But I, I've also got, you know, I've got a cool drum set here that I like to kick around on and even start my morning with is kind of my nice. zen, uh, you know, st- stress relief in the morning, uh, is just sit down with a pair of headphones and just, just play you know, for an hour or something. After, when you say headphones, coffee. you mean like play to t- play to a click or? No, I'll, I'll just I'll just have it because the 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 kit <laughs> during the quarantine the kit has replaced my coffee table in the studio, so the kit is now inside the control room, and I'll just have cans hooked up to Spotify or Tidal. I like to use Tidal, um, and and I'll just be listening to to music, and I'll just put something random on and just play play along with stuff for for an hour just wherever wherever kind of the spirit takes me um, that's cool man i like that yeah, i love playing just, drums man it's so fun it's so fun and and i'm i'm uh you know such a, a a novice drummer but it's uh it just feels so good when you when you're able to just have a have a, have a great pocket with something you're like man i'm imagine being able to do this all the time <laughs> uh, <laughs> i want to do more of it yeah, um, but yeah, I, I'll, I like to sit down and play and... drums like that too, and it's occasionally play to a click just because I, that can really help. Mm. Just train. Yeah, I feel like it helps me train myself to just like not be a spaz. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just just not not being so busy is like the biggest uh, discipline that that you know trying try, always trying to learn. It's like you don't have to do a fill every two bars. You know, you don't, don't even have, have to just... do the crash symbol. 
Yeah, just keep it. I don't even have a crash symbol in here. Nice. I, you know, I just try to try to keep it try to keep it simple and, you know, just hat ride and two toms, but um yeah, just 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 uh make make it feel good. Cool. All right, so I derailed you a little bit there. You were talking about some of the stuff. I think um I think you were mentioning that you are making a record with your with your significant other, your your uh, girlfriend. I am. Yeah. I am, yeah. You know, in that, uh, I think at, at the time of this taping, I think it will come out in a couple days, but uh, by the time the, the podcast comes out, it will have been out for a little while. Um, so I think it's safe to talk about it. Um, Kelsey Walden is my significant other, uh, and nice. we have been working on a, uh, a, a an EP of stuff um, together that I was fortunately put in the role of co-producer and uh recorded it and mixed the whole thing and uh that's a lot of roles to take on um <laughs> and, and uh, on top of you know being being somebody's uh being there when when you all get home from the studio at night yeah. too and, and yeah. managing dinner and you know we just got a little puppy dog and just the whole the whole nine so it's a lot it's a lot of roles but it was so fun and so um so eye-opening and there's just such a great uh, mutual level of respect you know, for, for each other that, that, uh, you know, I, I think deepened, uh, throughout the process and, um, yeah, love it. I are there, it came um, out great. are you, are you at Liberty? Are you at Liberty to speak freely, my son? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, what are some of the things about working with somebody that you're in a relationship with that can be, that you discovered that you're like, wow, this is, this is cool compared to working with, you know, a stranger or a new client. And then what are some of the things that would be you know, like these are typical um, struggles or challenges or, or places where you need to, you know, be aware. You want to, you want to get through this, uh, you know, obstacle or whatever. Unscathed, yeah. Um, well, you know, it's it's uh, I guess just the comfort level of you know um, uh, of being with somebody that that you know like, that you're you're with you know, so much and, and so comfortable with all the time. There's, there's pros and there's cons to that. You know, I feel like if you're, if you're working with an artist for the first time, everybody's kind of on their best behavior, so right, to speak. Right. And everybody's willing to compromise and willing to change. And yeah, sure. Let's try that. That sounds like a great idea. Um, maybe that's not the case if, if you're working with, uh, w with your, your spouse or significant mm -hmm. other, um, maybe it's like, no, nah, that's a dumb idea. Why would you even suggest that? Right, uh, You're more you comfortable know, to just cut right to the sure, yeah, the and and there, right? you know that that's great, you know, and you kind of know where everybody stands, but uh, you know, yeah, those were just it can can be a little bit challenging is is getting out um, or asking for asking and pushing somebody a little bit harder because it's like I don't know, I think on either side there's questions of like, well, are you pushing me because I'm your girlfriend or I'm your boyfriend, or are you pushing me because you really want this to be better, or are you being extra hard on me because we're together. You're so you, pissed are, that I didn't take the garbage out. <laughs> yeah. Or, or is it, yeah, is there something lingering right, here? Right, you know, right. I don't know. But the, the great thing about it is, is that nobody expects you home for dinner because you're working together on a thing. Ah, and, and you yeah. both, you know, you both want to be there um, and, and get it right. You know, so, yeah. so your, your kind of work ethic, you're, it's almost like you're doing a destination recording where you go out of, out of town and make a record which always feels so great because you, you uh, again, you're not, ex nobody's expecting you home for supper or nobody's expecting you to go and take the dog out or. Right. You don't have to anything. call because you're already there. Yeah. There together. Yeah. You know, you're just, you, you're, you're, we're both in here doing this together. So, we, you know, this is 100% of my focus uh, for this week or, you know, whatever, however long it is. Yeah. Um, so for example, great. if I'm recording or making music with somebody that I know really well, it can be comfortable because you, you know there's an open trust factor where like that person you know res likes or respects what you do so therefore you have an implicit permission to explore into territory and like take risks and stuff where that could feel you could feel apologetic about that when you're on your best behavior around a client you feel like maybe i need to play it safe so i could see yeah. how that would be a benefit sure yeah totally you know and and i'm I kind of always been been a fan of of swing for the fences and for for any kind of project and take risks and if if you um 
you know, try to hit a home run every time. And sometimes you're not going to hit a home run. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's, you're going to strike out, but at least you were trying to hit a home run every time and you weren't just, you know, kind of half-assing it. Um, so, so, you know, go, go big or go home, um, type of mentality. But, you know, I, I can understand with, with newer clients or, you know, an artist that you have never worked with before, there's, you're still kind of trying to, you've gotten the gig, but you're trying to keep the gig now. Uh, and you want, you know, you want to, um, you want to, again, yeah, be on your best behavior and, and kind of be agreeable and not, you know, nobody wants to be, uh, perceived as difficult or, you know, uh, grouchy in the studio, you know? Right. But, you know, we, let's, let's be honest. I mean, when you work long days, you work hard, we instinctively push ourselves to the limit because that's what the, our yep. love for the art asks for. Sure. But that means that you also need to be able to go like, you know, throw your headphones down. Well, hopefully not break them, but <laughs> yeah. you know, you need to have an expression of, of like, I've had enough. I need a break kind of thing. And if you're doing this with your significant other, um, you know, have you learned that there's, um, you know, uh, any, any sage advice about like, just remember this when, when you get to that point, any, anything you want to share about that? Well, it, you, for me personally, you know, it's like, it's, it's her record. You, you know, th this is your project at the end of the day. This is not my project. And, you know, you try to think about that with anything that you're working on. It's like, this is, if we're all not happy, then, you know, we failed. Uh, if we're, if we're all not, jazzed about something but um at the end of the day it is your it's your project and you you have the the final say on everything um but you know i might strongly strongly suggest several times in a row that, that uh right. you know we, we go this way or we try this thing or, or that thing or whatever and kind of just explaining your uh your your reasoning for it um but i don't know yeah at the end of the day just just trying to remember that it is it, it, the artist, uh, the artist wins every yeah. time, and and should be. Is it almost sounds like just good relationship advice? You know, it's just like you know, be be respectful of the fact that you know, the the um, choosing the furniture in the house is like you know, it's uh, it, it's their yeah, pick your know. battles. It's, it's maybe it's, it's their house too. You know, except in yeah. this case, you're like it's actually your record, and I'm just helping you do it as opposed to it's our record. Sure, but you know, you care about it so much because you know. A, you you care about everything that you do as a as a creative, or you should. Mm -hmm. um, but B, you know, because it's so important to the person that you love. So yeah. you 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 want to you want to care about it that much more. Um, but I feel like we had we we struck up a great um, a great working relationship in that way, uh, which was kind of new to us. Um, but you know, I think it was a uh, roaring success. Um, so this is uh, Kelsey Walden. Okay, cool. So one of the things about uh, listening to those tracks and Rockstars, I put this together into a playlist so you can go check them out in the show notes, click through, see the videos, and listen to the music. Um, I noticed you've, you're doing some acoustic guitar and then like full band kicks in into production. Talk about some of your favorite ways to record and mix acoustic guitar and some of the things, challenges or things that work well when you're going to incorporate that into a full band sound. Uh, well, my, the question I always ask myself when, when there's a, an acoustic guitar involved with a, with a production is just what role that acoustic guitar is taking. Um, is it, if it's going to be, you know, like a, um, a less dense production or, or mix where it's more singer songwriter and the acoustic is playing a heavier part and can take up a little bit more space sonically, then I would make different decisions than if, uh, if it was you know, basically just a percussive element that's going to be added into a super dense mix, you know. Um, right, if it needs if, to stand on its own, it has certain requirements, right? Right, right. You know, like uh, there, there's a, an artist um, that uh, I was producing engineering for that has a record that's going to be coming out, hopefully, uh, a couple months from when this podcast comes out. And we did a single coals on the vocal and a single coals on the acoustic guitar. And that's... Um, that was the first time I've ever done that. It's a very unlikely pairing of uh, acoustic vocal mics that I would use. But that's cool. The, uh, break that down for us. What um, what are those mics? And uh, tell us about how those mics work and how you would set them up for a recording like that. 
Oh, well, the, the Coles 4038 is, I believe, to be the oldest microphone still in production um, right now. Like Beatles uh, used them on guitar amps and stuff. They're ribbon microphones, the figure of eight microphones. Uh, they kind of look like, kind of remind me of a horseshoe. It's really cool right. looking microphones. Um, but uh, inherently pretty dark and, and bulky sounding uh, ribbon mics which I love them for their smooth kind of diminished top end and huge low end um, that they have. So I had those going into a couple Mog preamps where, you know, you kind of pop the top on with the air band and they're just have this brilliant, brilliantly smooth top end. So you actually, so with the Coles, you find it's useful to sort of boost the highs after. Yeah, because they have such a great natural, uh, uh, smooth top end to them, but they just need a, just a little bit of uh, just to bring it, bring us into, uh, a, a, you know, b- get a little bit of uh, modernness out of them. They just need mm-hmm. the need the top cracked open, <laughs> you right, know. Cracked open. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, just just a one coals on the acoustic. You know, maybe on the other side of where. Um, of where the the sound hole is on the acoustic, maybe more where his right hand is is doing the picking, or a little bit to the right of that. Okay, so was, not not at the classic twelfth fret on the strings. No, position. I kind of wanted, I, at least in this scenario, I wanted you know the body of the guitar to be you know the the thing, uh, yeah. and I want that right hand. He it was doing a lot of finger picking stuff too, so I wanted to kind of cap really capture that percussiveness uh, of it and and get kind of the the whole shape of the guitar. Um, so that's why I kind of went a little bit more towards the body. And so if you have that mic kind of pointing at the acoustic guitar, you kind of have the side of the mic, which, you know, in a figure eight mic, that's kind of your null point Mm -hmm. or the point that's going to get the most favorable rejection from the vocal. Try to kind of keep that into consideration, pointing that null point at at the voice or, you know, at, at his mouth. And same thing with the, um, the, the vocal mic, you kind of point the null where it's going to get the most rejection, you try to aim that at the acoustic guitar and try to just be able to separate those two things as much as you can if you want them to be, you know, to be manipulated uh, independently, you know, and you want the most separation you can. That's cool. So it's almost like it's it's like a trick of isolating the two mics from each other. So it won't, so it kind of feels like one's just guitar, one's just voice. Right, right. Yeah, totally. And so, you know, that, that way later on, if you want, to be able to turn that vocal up or down and not have the acoustic guitar dramatically uh, affected by that move, you know, you, you can. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so th- I mean, that would be my approach in, in, uh, for, for that type of scenario. If it was on, you know, like a, a super dense, uh, modern, you know, pop country track or something, I might take a single Sheps and, and point it at the 12th fret, uh, you know, like a Sheps CM6, uh, small condenser pencil condenser um this got a it's a little bit faster sounding so to speak uh a little bit more percussive and you know it stacks very easy in the bottom end won't bloom up on you if you double it um you know that that would be my approach for for something that's you know kind of on the opposite end of uh um you know sonically production wise okay cool right on and then um what about you know, the times when we should record the voice and the guitar together or do them separately? What, what thoughts there? Well, I mean, it's always just whatever whatever serves the song, isn't it? You know, it, it's it's always uh, whatever the artist is more comfortable with. Um, if you, if you're, you know, there's some folks that are like, man, I would love to just sing a scratch vocal and do this guitar and then we'll do another pass and I'll listen to my old scratch vocal, but I'll just do a clean acoustic guitar down with the band. Um, you know, and then I'll do a separate vocal. You know, I really want to concentrate on doing this versus that. But then there's sometimes where um, your your whole performance is dependent on your rhythm of your guitar playing, of of, the, of your finger picking. You know, so it's going to dramatically alter how your what your pocket is vocally if you're doing those things separately. So you can't detach them from one another. So it's just whatever whatever serves the song. Okay, cool. Yeah, it makes sense. It's just like what, um, but but importantly, as you're saying, it's whatever makes the artist feel comfortable about performing that song too. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, sure, sonically, in a perfect world, I would like you to do this vocal 
completely separate and I would like you to do this uh, this acoustic guitar completely separate. So I have I, great isolation. I can manipulate things. Uh, I can have a, a room mic maybe on the acoustic guitar or on the vocal, but it doesn't have each other. It doesn't have each of those elements in it. They're independent, um, but not at the sake of you not performing it well or as as well. Uh, you know, yeah. you just want to you want to do what's best. Bill Cheney, the founder of Spectra 1964, kept getting the same question from customers. What DI should they use with the 610 series comp limiters? After trying to recommend various DIs while making excuses for the way they all sounded, he realized that the solution was to create the perfect direct input box himself. Thus, the BBDI passive direct box from Spectra 1964 was born. By using Spectra design concepts and standards, the BBDI provides a low distortion and flat response design that is unequal by any standard or measure. The absence of harmonic distortion and articulation of signal detail is readily apparent. This is all done with a passive transformer type design that will provide years of trouble-free operation. Simply put, the BBDI is the best sounding bass DI I've ever used. It'll move your pant leg. No hype, no color, just pure tone at spectra1964.com. If your goal was to climb Mount Everest, you would hire a Sherpa to guide you to the summit. If you wanted to sail around the world, you would hire a seasoned sea captain for a safe voyage. And if you wanted to try skydiving, you wouldn't just jump out of an airplane without being strapped to an expert, right? So why would you send off your mix for mastering without knowing that it was ready first? Wouldn't it be great to have a professional mastering engineer with a trained ear to guide you through the final stages of mixing? Brian Murphy is your trusted guide at soundporter.com home of the iterative mastering process, where you get to interact with a professional mastering engineer who listens to what you want and will give you mix feedback to help you get your mix ready for mastering. Contact Brian now for a free mix review and mastering demo so that you can hear it before you buy it at soundporter.com. So now uh, to go back to the vocal tuning thing for just a quick Mm -hmm. second... If a vo- voice is recorded with a guitar, are we pretty much letting go of that tuning option? Yeah, it, sometimes. Sometimes you can do it, sometimes not. Um, it, it depends on how good your isolation is uh, and also kind of how far you're trying to tune it. If you're trying to take it a, a full step away, you know, you're probably going to run into an issue. Um, you know, if you're doing slight, slight, weeks you know in a, in a in a dense mix you know you may be able to get away with it if your isolation is not so great if your isolation is good you can normally you, you can tune them independently of one another yeah and um, i guess the nice thing about tuning a vocal where the guitar is bleeding through is it it actually just makes the guitar sound a little bit 12 string in that moment sure yeah and who doesn't cool, who right? doesn't yeah who doesn't love a 12 string yeah. i actually uh doing a sometimes i'll have luck if i have a room mic on a vocal and you need to tune the lead vocal, and you can't you, you can't really tune the. It's not like you can tune the that line on the close mic and then tune it independently on the far mic. So I'll put it into a, I'll put it onto a stereo track where, and then I'll try to tune that to where the tuner you graph in, and it it sees what's on the left side. That's what it graphs in, but it applies that tuning exactly the same to both. You know what I'm saying to to both um, to both tracks. So it'll actually tune the far mic exactly the same, and then once you once you've done that, you just render them back to two separate tracks. And sometimes that you can get away with doing that. Oh, okay, cool. So if you do a room mic on the vocals, it's a mono room mic a lot of times, anyway. Yeah, well, I'm, it's I I don't know. It's it's <laughs> always it's it's always different. Yeah. Sometimes if they're in a big, if we move the vocal out to the live room, I might take the the drum room mics, which would be stereo. If I had a stereo source easily had, then I would take it stereo. But if we were in a small booth or something, um, you know, where where there is a little bit of ambience to be had, I would just do a mono thing. And yeah, um, yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah, and, and um, it's just that reminder that you know, with the tuning stuff, you can group tracks and edit them together. But um, I don't think I've figured out a way to group tuning elements together. I can't even remember if I can group within Melodyne. Or not, um, but yeah, that's it's good to know that there are workarounds like that. 
Right. Yeah. So let me let me jump forward and let's talk about your mix template for just a sec because I know sure. you discussed it last time, but I thought I'd ask you know if there's anything in the past year or two where you've kind of evolved your mix template and anything you feel like talking about. Hmm. Um. Not sure. I'm not sure if it's changed much within the the last year or if I was kind of doing it this way before, but. Um, or just any new fun, um, you know, mixing things you've been using or new plugins you've enjoyed or whatever. Yeah, totally. Man, there's always so much new stuff. The Oak Sound Spiff, uh, I just got onto within the past six months. I know I'm late to that party, but that that's amazing. Um, and the Soothe from Oak Sound is amazing as well. Um, you What's know, of course, Spiff? All, Spiff is like a, it's like a, um, I don't know what, Technically, you would you would call the the category of it, but it's like a transient um, modulation, almost like an SPL transient designer type, you know, f- thing. But it's kind of a multi band uh, version of that. Yeah, it's you cool can, looking. I'm looking at it up right now online. It looks like uh, yeah, know, man. You, like you fun should, you, bouncing lines. Yeah, try 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 the demo uh, of it. it. It's amazing, especially on toms or or kick drums where you want to. It's like, okay, I want to accentuate, I want to take the sustain out of the mid-range of the tom, but I want to extend the sustain on the low end, the thunder portion of the tom, and I also want to extend the 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 attack on the, the tip-top, the, the crack of the tom. You can kind of just independently manipulate all of those things. And, wow, that's cool. Um, yeah, man, so so great. And, um, and on their demo on the website it says remove mouth clicks so i guess it's also um you can take out transients that might be that sort of thing sure yeah totally i use it a lot on acoustic guitars and banjos to take out some of the plectrum sound you know if you you can kind of um i use isotope for that a lot too. yes that's what i'm that's what my go-to we're using isotope right now on mixing this podcast oh great hopefully i'm not giving you too much work to do try it out uh... give us us some mouth noises (laughs) um yeah we'll see how i do (laughs) Um, but yeah, you, you can use it to kind of take out the pick noise on an acoustic guitar. Uh, you know, you isolate where, where that pick noise is and kind of just pull it down, you know, and the, the interface is super easy to use and yeah, I, I, I love it. Been cool, loving, man. uh, everything from them. Uh, what about, mixed- maybe it's worth just commenting on, but that feeling of like, sometimes we get these tools and we're like, oh, so cool. You can do all these things. And then you go mm-hmm. do a bunch of stuff, and then later you're like, oh, "It just sounds like it just did too much stuff," you know? Yeah, it's it's it maybe easy to get a little heavy handed with with a lot of the stuff, but um, how, how do you, you know, I, do you like have a method for checking yourself and making sure you can go back and sort of not do as much stuff? I, I suppose it's just a feel thing, and just just been after you've been doing it for a while, you you kind of know what what too much sounds like you know immediately you know it kind of hits you immediately like well that's that's way too much or that's completely unnatural sounding um that i I guess it just takes a little bit of of more mileage to maybe be able to sense that immediately um but yeah you know it's always you know it's always again listen listening in the car listening on you know i've got an ipad that's set up in my mix room that is always open and always has a a, a decibel meter up just so I can always, I try to be at the same level roughly um, all the time. You mean for speaker monitoring level? Mm -hmm. What, um, what is that and where do you put it to even make that decision for yourself? Well, I mean, it may not be the most accurate thing. It's also just an iPad app, but um, yeah, but it's probably picking up the one K region pretty well. Sure. Yeah. To, to get in the ballpark, I have it just directly to the right of me. You know, it's probably uh, three, three to four feet away. It's within arm's reach, um, just about. And I try to live in the, you know, 70 to 80, um, you know, 70, more 70 to 75 dB region uh, mm-hmm. whenever I'm working. I, I find that that's kind of like the, the place where you can, at least on these speakers, I can feel the bottom end a little bit and kind of get a good, be a good judge of, of where that's landing. Um, and I can kind of work the longest there without really getting blown out. Or, you know, also when you're, I'm constantly listening to reference tracks of stuff in the same genre or, or mixes that I love or that I know really well. I'll kind of always just pop those back and forth and I'll, I'll throw them into every mix that I do um, on a track and just be able to pop those open and see like, oh, well, that's where that's where the bass is hitting 
here, that's where it should be hitting, you know, for, for, for me, if, if I want it to feel that way, once it gets to a car or once it gets to, you know, a telephone. Right. But you're, you, you're letting that iPad, um, SPL meter or whatever, make sure that your reference track is also playing back at a similar volume. So you're, you're comparing right, apples so you just, to apples. Yeah. So you just kind of have a context of where, where you're at, you know, like if you, if you find yourself turning up and then turning down and turning up all, all the way through your mix, you kind of get lost as to like, well, what, what is too loud and what's not loud. So if you, if right. you just leave it kind of at a, at a static volume and now, now that's your volume and you've, you know, you, you set that to be, you know, whatever ground zero, so to speak, um, you, you can kind of make, make more accurate choices. Yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's interesting. It's a good reminder. It's like, if you're mixing a song from the beginning of the song to the end in one pass, then mm-hmm. it kind of, it almost, I don't want to say it doesn't matter where your speaker volume is at, but it, but you could have it low or have it loud and you just, you'd be in that moment. So you'd know what felt relatively mm-hmm. loud or soft, but you're yep. right. Since mixing often takes over much longer period of time. Mm-hmm when we're turning things up and down, we just lose sense of, we just lose our reference of like, because we're constantly having to decide to turn something up or down depending on how it feels to us. That's all we're doing is turning stuff up and down. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just seeing, seeing like, does this sound better when it's louder or when it's not as loud? Yeah, but if you don't know what loud and not as loud is anymore, then how would you know where to exactly. set your fader? So smart, yep. man, cool. Yeah, idea. you got to set a baseline. But also the, so that iPad also has um, this app called Audrio. It's A U D R E I O, and it's a thing that I found where it's a plug-in that you put like on your mix bus. The final, you know, what I put it on my print track, and you, you're as long as you're to, you know, my my mixing computer and my iPad is connected to the same Wi-Fi, I can stream audio directly to that iPad or to my phone or any other device that has this Audrio app on it, and I can kind of in real time see how it's going to sound on this iPad or on my phone. So I'll do that a lot to, during the course of a mix and see if, see if I can actually hear that cool bass line that's going on or whether a little, little 2K, a little more 2K is in order for it to kind of cut through and be able to hear it on phones because you have to take that stuff into consideration because that's uh, uh, what most people honestly are listening on. Okay, cool. So I, yeah, I'm looking at that website now because I'm mm-hmm. just... Sitting in front of the computer so I can look at yeah. stuff while we're talking about it. But the um it looks like that's an iOS app that you can get and then you just buy the plug in for twenty five yep. bucks is what it says here. So that's pretty cool. And then and then it but it just does it on a local network. So it it doesn't go over the internet. Um I think it's right. for I, local, could, right? I couldn't I couldn't send it to a client, you know, to so that they're listening in real time. That's that's yeah. not what this is. This is strictly for so I can hear, so I can go from my mains, my tannoys or PMCs. And I can bounce with the click of a button. I can bounce over to my telephone uh, or, or the iPad on the other side of the room, and I can just turn around and listen to it through that and see if that's that's your best gauge of of, of whether your vocal's too loud or too soft. Is listen to it on the on the phone or on on an iPad or, yeah. or you know on your on your Ortone or you know whatever. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And then um, does it does that one actually give you a big delay between? Making a move in Pro Tools and and having it actually play back out of the other speaker. No, it's it's not. It's not a not a noticeable delay. You know, there there may be a ten millisecond, fifteen millisecond type you know thing, but not enough to. And I, I don't think I would really be doing too many rides and stuff while going through an iPad. Maybe maybe if I'm automating like a reverb or something, and you really want it to you really want it to be known and it's like of course it's going to be that ride is going to be apparent when you're on these brilliant sounding speakers that you're sitting in the sweet spot but right. is it really going to come across you know to listeners who are just listening with the phone on the table okay cool um, good tip um and then the other one that i do use also um that will let you stream it over the internet is called audio movers yeah you know i've i've heard about that especially during during the the quarantine stuff um I, I honestly have not used it yet. I just have not been in a situation where that has been a thing, but uh, I hear great things. It's pretty cool. You know, we did a session where um, it was a group of friends and we were writing songs and recording them together and one of the guys couldn't make it. So I mm-hmm. turned on the audio movers thing and I had it like all weekend. It was just streaming 
to yeah. him in another city, and he was he just thought it was the greatest experience ever to be able to yeah. listen to all the bullshit that we would say on the session yeah. and everything. What an amazing world we live in. Yeah, yeah, cool, man. The secret to a great mix is to start with great source tracks. And this means you need great microphones. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia brings you the new BB29 Signature Series microphone to help your recordings add clarity and detail to your mixes. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design with a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity without distracting colorations and distortions. The new BB29 microphone has a Class A discrete amplifier Fire circuit, extremely low self noise, and transformer coupled output to bring an expensive sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay Z offers a five year warranty, free shipping to the US, and a 30 day money back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jayzmike.com. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer and a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins and pre-sona Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. Let's see, what else? What else is uh, sort of new uh, for you with uh, with the mixing and having fun? Man, I'm, I'm trying... Uh... That's not new for me. I'm always having fun. I'm always trying to have fun. I'm always trying to do, you know, different things or or experiment with new new plugs or you know whatever. Uh, I don't know if we got into it last time. Kind of the my my kind of summing situation. What's going on over here? Sure, we'll just talk about it again. What do you want to say about it? Well, I basically I just have I've got you know three three separate stereo buses that are that are going out to a dangerous D box and then coming back in and printing, you know, to my final stereo track. And I'll treat those three buses independently of each other. And typically the three buses are, would be my track, my instrumental, uh, stereo bus, my vocal stereo bus, and then any effects that I have would be a third stereo bus. And I'll treat them all separately, then send them out, uh, to, to do my analog summing via this dangerous D box and then come back in and, and print. Um, and what I've, I've found that to be able to, to enable me to do is to treat, especially the vocal, uh, as separate from my mix bus processing is, is, uh, you know, I, w- I wanted to be able to separate it so that I can really squeeze the track and I can, then I can have this vocal, which feels like it has all this breath to it and isn't as squashed. I can have that separate kind of just lightly placed on top of on top of the mix okay so like for the instrument for the band you could be mixing through a ssl compressor where it's kind of pumping and rocking Mm -hmm. but you can have the vocal stay more consistent across that by blending them back together after that right or you can you know i use a lot of like uh, distortion harmonic distortion and try to use a lot of fuzz and get some some kind of uh space between the notes stuff happening uh especially in you know in the instrumental track that maybe i don't want to apply that as much to and i want to keep this vocal a nice pristine uh thing that's just kind of sitting on top um i can with this method i can kind of really get this track the band down and dingy and i can have this beautiful airy silky smooth vocal that's that's right there alongside it but they're not it's not affected by any of the um it's not getting dirtied up by any of my moves that I'm doing for the for the track. How did you arrive at that kind of breakout? Was it just trial well, and error? Well, I think really what came it came from I was working with a producer and they wanted this vocal at a, like what he described as superstar level, and it was just a means to an end to get it to be louder. I literally could not get this vocal any louder for this for this project, and um, it was beyond what. 
you know, maybe what I thought was uh, appropriate for for the track, right. but hey, you know, they're the boss. Um, and so, in an effort to get it louder, I, I just notice it just keeps getting way down with any kind of any kind of compression that I put on the mix bus. Um, and my my mix wasn't it wasn't gelling, it wasn't feeling solid and coming together because any any compression I put on the mix bus was just getting slammed by this vocal. So being able to treat it separately enabled me to have this vocal be sky high and uh, affect my instrumental uh, separately. Okay, so yeah, when you're running everything through a stereo bus compressor, that is one of those things that you discover sort of frustratingly at some point in mixing where you turn something up and you turn something up and you're like, I don't know, I just can't seem to get that snare out front or I can't get that vocal out front. Um, mm -hmm. And then maybe you even bypass the compressor for a minute and your mix is like utterly out of whack and the vocal or snare is like insanely Falls way apart, too loud. Yeah. You know? That happens to me with limiters sometimes, you know? Sure, yeah. You know, so that that's kind of how I came to that solution of of mixing this way was just trying to get a vocal at, at a superstar level. Um, you know, you can treat them, you can treat it independently, and then now they're just living alongside your instrumental, uh, and they don't have to be sharing the same processing. Um, and then as far as the third stereo uh, bus that I'll use for effects and stuff, it enables me to kind of just thin out the bottom independently, you know, just globally on my effects, roll off anything below 100 or, or so, maybe pop the top with a little mog EQ and do a little imaging, um, you know, spread, a little stereo spread to kind of spread my effects super wide, left and right. Um, I find that it, it's useful for that. Oh, the, the using the spreading effect on all the effects returns? Yep. So, I mean, all of my effects returns are going to an effects bus and treating that bus separately just like i'm treating the instrumental bus separately just like i'm treating the vocal bus separately um yeah that those are just a couple things that i'll do for the effects bus is kind of thin it out pop the top and and spread it a little um a little wider left and right awesome very cool um and then all three of those do they then go to something else that has any kind of treatment or is it is it sort of like no more manipulation so after that no, there's there's always more manipulation. Um, so they'll they'll go they'll go outboard to if I have anything you know hardware wise, which I, I very rarely do. But they'll they'll just go out to my dangerous D box and they'll be summed together in the analog realm there, and then I'll print them back in. So basically, I'll come back in to an aux, uh, which I'll have a couple more plugs in. So now once they've all joined together, those three buses that's the time where I will process them as, as one stereo unit. And that might just be, you know, like a little ATR, you, you know, little, little half inch or one inch emulation, um, or, you know, maybe just a little bit, a touch more of global EQ to all of it, or maybe that Oak sound soothes to kind of take a little harshness away or, or, or something. I'll, I'll treat them all like that once they come back in and treat them as a stereo source. And then I'll print them to two separate tracks, one with a limiter and one without. I'm glad you brought up uh, soothe and harshness because I feel like harshness is one of the challenges when mixing, especially when you're, you know, kind of doing the home studio thing or maybe things have been recorded and maybe, you know, maybe they're just a harshness went into the recording of the, of the music. Mm -hmm. What are some things that will help us tone down harshness. I, I had a specific question. I, I guess I was thinking about the, um, uh, the, the Roswell kid, um, stuff mm. and, um, you know, some of the other rock bands that you've mixed, right. um, where like you've, you, there's a smooth quality to it and mm -hmm. rock is the place where like mid range just builds up until it's just like, it wants to rip your head off, you know? Totally. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a funny thing trying to, like, a lot of times trying to make the most obnoxious sound as possible. You know, it, it, like in the case with the Roswell Kid stuff, it's like making the most obnoxious sound possible, but not making it feel like sonically fatiguing or super obnoxious right. that so way. You want to be able to listen um, to it, right? Sure. Yeah. In, yeah. In most places. Um, so I, I think it's just, you know, f figuring out the anomalies of your room also is like what, what, in, in listening on several different sources, like listening on a phone, listening on an iPad, listening on a small set of speakers, listening in mono, listening to it and getting to know all these different things. Um, 
then, you know, in theory, you know, any kind of harshness would pop out on at least one of those right. well, sources. If, if we assume for a minute that we have, are having no trouble hearing just how shitty and harsh our mixes are sounding, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where, where are some places that we are likely creating that harshness and enhancing it where we di maybe didn't realize it? And what are some of the tools that really help us pull that back? Is it like, is compression causing us to exaggerate that and we didn't realize it? Is EQ a tool that we need to be bolder with about toning down harshness? Yeah, I would say, I would say, you know, like some of those problems can come about um, by, by way of compression. Really smashing up a, a drum room mic can bring out some real nastiness and some cymbals, but it's mostly, you know, it's an EQ problem, isn't it? It's, it the, the harshness. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, anywhere between 3K to to Seven, eight K is where for me things get really annoying really fast. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, you know, like just along the way as, as you're building stuff, you're you're kind of making little moves to make to bring out any anomalies that that are are poking out in an unnatural way, or there's there's weird resonances somewhere. But um, on a global uh, on a global view, that that's where the Oak Sound Soothe uh, really comes in handy because it kind of automatically will identify if you're playing your whole mix through it's like well there's a pretty big build up here at 2k let's let's tuck that down a little bit and let's see how you feel <laughs> you know okay um, cool yeah i haven't used soothe it, yet but i've heard it talked about a lot and it sounds like it's pretty badass it's great it's great it's great as a de-esser it's great as a um you know like taking a little bit of great it, it's got some really wonderful presets on it with some really um insightful words like graininess or you know like uh, uh harshness or um you know stuff like that there's a great preset that i start from that's called a bit less would do a bit less um, would do with yeah, a british and, accent and, yeah it has to be um and another great thing about that plug is you can there's a way where you can listen to exactly what it's it's taking away too and you can so if you you go into that mode and you're like Exactly. What are you are you doing here? What are you taking away? Oh yeah, that's it. That's really annoying. Uh, or you know, you can kind of move stuff around and be like, no, that's that's where I'm really having having a hard time with. Right. So oh, so you can hear it like the way you hear it. What the deesser is taking out the s's. Yep. You're you're hearing just that band or just you know whatever. Yeah. So you know, on a on a um, singular level, you know, you're trying to. I always try to roll off things that you know, 16K or, or 14K or, you know, depending right. on the thing. All I feel my like that's a tough returns. lesson to learn. That's a tough lesson to learn because you think like, why did I just go buy this mic that has all this airy top so that I can record something and then remove it in the mix, you know? Yeah, well, but I guess that's you what mixing you is, right? Yeah, you don't need airy top on. Everything can't have airy top or else nothing has airy top, you know? Good, uh, good, good quote right there. So, <laughs> so all, uh, that's my epitaph. Um, so, you know, all, all of my effects returns and stuff, it's like, it, normally I'll roll off the, the extreme top end uh, on all that stuff and the extreme bottom end, um, you know, because, I don't know, to me, everything, it's all about the mid-range. Yeah, um, yeah. Do you feel like the time you spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen, I appreciate you listening to this podcast, and I know you're trying to make your best record ever. But when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy-winning quality, then you're ready for UltimateMixingMasterclass.com. Um, and then I feel like another thing that I'm constantly reminded of the value of is just the mute button. So what I'm getting mm -hmm. at is I can have a mix going and there's stuff like, you know, a, a classic example would be 
this, the fill comes and this crashes are happening and I've been ignoring it for a while until all of a sudden I'm like, what am I doing? That crash is like ripping my head off on the downbeat mm-hmm. of that section. I'm, it's never going to be good until I deal with that. And then you go right. look at it and you're like, I don't understand. It doesn't sound that bad in the overheads until you realize that it was the crash bleeding through the Tom mic that was so insane because you're trying to crank up sure. the toms and the fill going into it, you know? Yep. And it's an unnatural uh, opening of the toms if they're gated, you know, the yeah. opening of it. And you, all of a sudden you just hear that. And, and uh, you know, and pertinent to that, or like the hi-hat's insane. And you're like, you're listening to the overheads again, or the, even the hi-hat mic. And you're not realizing mm-hmm. it's just because you compress the hell out of the snare mic. It's just coming through the snare mic, you know? Right. And it's that uh, power of having quick access to the mutes so that when you hear, when I hear a problem, I'll go through and just like start muting stuff until the problem goes away. And that's how you figure out where it was coming from, you know? And so being able to do that kind of muting quickly, again, we're back to your control surface. That's one of the places where I imagine it's really helpful. You can like quickly mute a bunch of stuff until you figure out where that crappy sound is coming from. Yeah, man. And you know, that's kind of something that I learned along the way too, is you don't have to use everything that you recorded. Um, you, you know, I, I know, and, and I used to be that same way is where every session, basically you, I put up the same, the same amount of microphones, you know, mm-hmm. if it was kind of the same instrumentation, you would always put up, you know, stereo rooms, you always put up, you know, your kind of drum crush mic you know, crotch mic, whatever you want to call it. Um, you always put up this, you always put up that. And then you, at first you always want to use all of it. And and it's just not necessary to use all of it all the time. Some of it is necessary. Sometimes it is necessary to use all of it and it's great and everything is useful. And you kind of drift into that place, you know, as you go along further to where you, you refine everything and now everything is useful because you're using everything for a certain characteristic but um i don't know i just just the lesson of not having to just because you recorded tom mics doesn't mean you have to use them right if if it sounds great ride mic right it's there as a safety not not because you are supposed to sneak it in that's that's the the telltale for me when i find myself sneaking in oh here's this one i'll just sneak it in until like oh that's too much then i'll pull it back and then you're like cool that must be where it belongs until later, you're like, no, dude, you just didn't need to use that at all. Like, yeah, go the three be, mics be bold. were great, you know. Yeah, be bold. Nothing should be, um, nothing should be snuck in or turned down. Like, uh, the guitar part's cool, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe tucked in the mix, it'll be cool. It's like, no, tucked in the mix, it will not be cool. It will just clog everything up and make everything else less defined because now you added another ingredient to this that wasn't necessary. And you you're know, having to compensate for it. There's uh, an and, interesting and, thing that pops into my head about that too, which is the you know, the idea of masking. So masking hmm. says that like, you know, if something's a little louder than something else, you don't hear the something else because your your ear hears the th- something that's a little louder. Mm-hmm. And sure. that's sort of at the basis, that's sort of at the root um, concept of how they can make an MP3 compress because they're getting rid of sounds that they've decided you don't really have to hear. Yeah, they think you don't need. Yeah, it's a whole other topic. But but um, but I, what I'm realizing as we're talking about this is, well, you're physically that quiet or tucked down sound. It's still in there. It's still making mm-hmm. waveforms and creating things, and like you just said, clogging up the sound. And your ear physically still hears it. Sure. Yeah. So it's, it's like something being it's out still of there. It's like something being out of phase. It's like one one waveform is going has positive energy, one has negative energy, and now both of them are happening at the same time. Your speaker doesn't know which way to go, so now you're yeah. just left with it not moving at all and it feeling lifeless. Yeah, um, but it's like the only reason we think that that tucked down thing isn't really causing a problem is because our brain is is fooling us into thinking, well, we don't hear it now, so that must be where it belongs or something. So, or just your sense of attachment to it. Like, well, it right. took us an hour to <laughs> record it. You know, it, I, I used a $1,400 pair of Josephine mics on these toms. I got to use them. Well, you know? if you use the, what is it, the E22S, uh-huh. then you probably do have to use them. <laughs> yeah, no, that's I do. I do own a pair and they're the most brilliant tom mics ever. But, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, that's a, it's a good lesson. Thank Don't always have to. Me. Don't have to have. Don't have to use them. I gotta get some of those mics. So, dude, uh, we are we are hitting the end of our wonderful interview round two yeah, here. Man. 
Um, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to give a shout out to? Oh, um, man, no, there's nothing, uh, nothing on, on my mind, so to speak. All right. Um, dig it. Well, why don't I go to our closing question again? Um, this is the one I probably asked you last time, but we'll ask, ask it in a maybe slightly different context. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we can take the way back studio machine and you go find Justin, uh, always back. I don't know. Um, maybe mm -hmm. before you built this studio or something like that, and you go back and give yourself a little bit of advice and you say, dude, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of your future studio. Um, mm. maybe pertaining to mixing or maybe even to pertaining to like producing a record with your, your, um, significant other, what mm -hmm. advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Um, tr trust your instinct, uh, you know, trust your instinct and, and, and don't, don't be afraid to, to put in the work. You know, I, I feel like I, I never was afraid to put in the work, but I, that's an important thing to, um, to, to keep in mind is like, you know, it's, it's not easy. If it was easy, yeah, everybody would do it. Right. Um, you know, so it's like, you, you got, you gotta, you have to throw yourself into it a hundred percent, especially in this field. It's like, you have to be we are some of the most dedicated, uh, you know, like to, to, to the point of our, uh, demise, uh, dedicated people ever, you know, and I'll come down here to the studio and not leave until after dark and I'll come out and it's, it's dark and I, I, you didn't need all day. You didn't, right, you know, right. what, what, what are you doing? It's like, you just get so lost in it and so immersed in it. And that's such a wonderful thing. Um, you know, so just the, 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 um, throwing yourself a hundred percent into it and, and training those instincts are, are a super important thing early on. Yeah. And I guess if it's like, you know, don't be afraid to do the work, that means putting in the hour into that sound and, and maybe trust your instinct is when your instinct tells you, you should just delete the sound, just delete throw it. it away. Yeah. Throw it away. The harder exactly. you worked on it, the more you should throw it away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh man. I don't know if everybody should take that advice or not. <laughs> yeah. Well, well dude, work hard on it and I don't know, know, know if it's, uh, uh, yeah, just training yourself to know whether it's worth keeping or worth throwing away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, I met, I don't know if they should take my advice, but yours is great. Yours is golden. Um, hmm. Let the rock stars know where they can go uh, follow you online and where, should, where do you want them to go check out your music? Uh, what if they need to make their next hit record and they want to reach out to you? Oh, um, all the usual places. Um, Instagram, J Ryan Francis. Uh, my middle name is Ryan, Justin Ryan Francis. That's where that comes from. Right. Um, J, J Ryan I'm um, on the Facebooks. I'm on, I'm on all of it. Carrier pigeon. Come out and see me Carrier when it's pigeon. deemed safe to do so. Uh, <laughs> come out and see me Mount National city. Holler. Awesome, dude. Well, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast again. I look forward to, uh, getting to hang out in person. And, um, you know, I think we got to make a record together at some point. I would love it. I would love nothing more. All right, man. Take care, dude. Cheers. All right. You too. Talk to you soon. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make make great music.
Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who help make this episode possible. Sound Porter Mastering, OWC, Adam Audio, Spectra 1964, Isotope, and Jay-Z Microphones. Remember to get your free mastering demo at soundporter.com and use the coupon codes ROCK10 at Isotope for an additional 10% off and ROCKSTARS at jayzmike.com for 50% off the BB29 for a limited time. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to give a big thank you to our rock star team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Weselchenko, Braden Stremming, and Hugh McDonald for additional podcasts and video production. You guys rock. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.